Welcome to today's Education and Public Outreach Colloquium and ADIAC <coughs> Talk. This is a first joint venture for us, and I'm pleased that you're all here. There's some more seats over here on this side if you're just coming in. Um, I don't have any particular announcements today for Education and Public Outreach, so I will turn the microphone over to Bill Corso for our, to, to introduce our speaker. Thanks. Thank you, Holly. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming. I will be brief. Obviously, our guest speaker today needs no introduction, but I want to highlight something that is particularly timely, I think. If you received the New York Times, this past Sunday's magazine has an article in it entitled, The Weatherman is Not a Moron. <laughs> <laughs> the article's focus is on how NSEP and others are effectively forecasting the weather. And I'd like to just briefly highlight two paragraphs in it from inside the National Centers for Environmental Prediction look like a cross between a submarine command center and Goldman Sachs trading floor. <laughs> For those of you that haven't visited their recent new building, I would highly recommend it. This past summer, all of NSEP as well as several other elements of NOAA and some other entities have moved into a state-of-the-art facility over on the College Park Research Campus, M Square. Dr. Cellini is going to show us a picture and talk a little bit about it. Uh, it's five minutes away from here. So to in, if you're interested more on the operational side of things, I urge you to go visit our colleagues over there. Secondly, one of the other paragraphs in this article says, why are weather forecasters succeeding where other predictors fail? And it goes on to highlight a variety of elements Two of which, though, I want to emphasize this afternoon. One, not only the hard work the folks at NSIP do, but the work we do here at Goddard to advance the state of the art of the science. But I think more importantly, because of our esteemed speaker and his past leadership these many years over at NSIP. Mm -hmm. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Uchulik. OK, so first of all, I, I got to bring that home because um, I know there are family members who think I'm a moron. Okay. Um, there have been some forecast busts that I've had to bring home and, um, or that happened while I was home and have one of my kids walk into the bedroom the next morning and say, did they actually pay you to do this? <laughs> so it's a pretty rough crowd there. Um, but the article is really interesting because it's, it's emphasizing that um, you know, in terms of prediction, this is, the, this is the, the success story. And that's one of the things I'm going to cover here. And they compare it to other areas, especially in economics, and that where, you know, nobody saw the, the well, some people did. But institutionally, um, they didn't see the collapse coming, or they didn't predict stuff happening in Europe, this, this kind of thing. Um, so it's, it's really an interesting article, to say the least. Uh, the other comment I was going to make here was the, uh, I do feel like I'm coming home. Uh, I spent 11 years uh, building 22 before they built the palaces over on this side of the road. So, it's, you know, it's like coming back to your hometown after a while, you don't recognize the place, but I do recognize faces here, so it's a little bit different. But so I am glad to be back and um, show you what we've been up to. Okay, so what I'll do, um, in the classic NASA way, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you, and then I'm going to tell you what I just showed you, right? <laughs> Let you know that I brought something over with me when I left uh, Goddard. Uh, so I'm going to set the stage in terms of advancing prediction of extreme events, and I'm going to go through some examples. There's some stats, you know, everybody's got to see stats, but uh, the fact that we're now predicting extreme events is part of the uh, uh, the amazing advancements I think we've made. Uh, when I went over to the Weather Service in 1989, there was actually memos written about not even trying to predict extreme events because you're just going to false alarm everything and therefore you're not going to get the response you need. Um, the transformation of the forecast process and really emphasize today's model-based operational system. I want to get to the R2O. 
uh, and this need to accelerate, not just conduct research to operations, but we have to accelerate it. A real short time frame in terms of uh, people's patience, you know, especially those that are funding you. Uh, then the O2R, um, this is something that I'm really emphasizing, to accelerate R2O, you must support O2R. So in Europe, I give talks in Europe, all the scientists are using operational models to do their research, including Brian Hoskins. Okay? Um, I know that's not going to happen in this country, but it certainly facilitates research to operations into the European Center and UK Met when you have people like that using your models to uh, do the research. I'll give two examples of current testbed efforts and then, uh, and then a summary. Okay, so I always show the European Center slide first because <laughs> it's, it's really a, a powerful slide. Um, so these are the uh, 500 millibar G potential height anomaly correlations. It's really a measure of what's going on at 500 millibar, um, about 5,000 meters up. Um, and higher is better. It's not only a measure of the accuracy of the individual measurements, but it takes into account the gradient. So day three, we've gone up and, and then it plateaus. Day five goes up and now it's plateauing. And day seven, the top line is the northern hemisphere. The bottom line is the southern hemisphere. So the fact that these are close to each other now means that we're making predictions in both hemisphere with um, uh, almost equal accuracy, and this is a reflection of the use of the satellite data. As everybody knows we don't have the in-situ data uh, in the northern hemisphere that we have in the southern hemisphere. So you have tremendous advancements here. You got basically, uh, Tony Hollingsworth used to say you had a day, a decade in terms of skill improvements based on a number of factors which we'll get to in a minute. Uh, this is our diagram and what we're doing here, this is something I have to use at the Department of Commerce. So this is the same score for the northern hemisphere, and then this is the score for the southern hemisphere. And then these lines are what we're getting from a system circa 1995 with no changes made. So this basically baselines the prediction uh, from about what we had in 95 in terms of computers, um, uh, software, and the use of the data. And then these are our operational uh, scores here. So the difference between here and here is where we would, um, you know, I can show that the investments made in terms of the science, computers, our use of observations, et cetera, has gotten us, us the skill increase. And then you see the same thing happening here with the um, skill increase in the southern hemisphere. I should note that increases like this, uh, this is where we started using satellite radiances instead of trying to make the satellite look like a radiosan. Okay, we spent 30 years trying to do that and then uh, figuring out that well, let's get the radiance in there with a the fast forward radiative transfer model and things can work better and you'll start seeing that kind of, so we can make these kind of direct connections. Now, uh, the other thing I'll use is that same score averaged over a year. Um, how far out in time can you go before you fall below a useful skill uh, limit? Useful skill of, and don't ask me to find the paper on this, okay, but people use 0 .60 for useful skill from a forecast. So on average now, where you can get out to eight days in advance with useful skill uh, just by this measure. Okay, the European Center, by the way, can get out to nine days. If we use an ensemble approach, we can show that we can add a day and a half with our system. So. Um, we're clearly in that getting into the front end of week two with useful skill. So why is this important? Um, I want to show how this relates to individual events. Um, and, and you're seeing this more and more in the news that people have, oh, we heard about this storm seven days in advance so we could get ready for it. So, you know, back in when I was at Goddard Space Flight Center and we were doing uh, studies on cyclones, this was one of the famous papers that Reed and Albright put out in 1986, major cyclone off the west coast, deepened very rapidly in this from 992 to 956 to 947, an incredible storm system not predicted at all. I don't, that, even, we had trouble even analyzing this storm with the capabilities we had in the early 80s. You go to 2008 and there's a west coast rain snow event with hurricane force winds along the, east coast, uh, along the west coast, 
uh, almost 10 feet of snow in the Sierra, uh, 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 about 10 inches of rain, uh, flood conditions. Uh, three weeks prior to the event, we actually, uh, we now have MJO updates for those folks doing research in the Madden Julian Oscillation. Uh, we pointed to the potential uh, for rainfall uh, during this period. Uh, when we got to the six to 10 day outlook, uh, we emphasized the heavy rains and snow, uh, January 3rd through 5th. And then when you get out um, uh, in a four to five day range, this was our QPF forecast. I can guarantee you that this type of specificity we just didn't even do 15 years ago, all right? So clearly they had um, uh, warning on this and, and from a weather service perspective, we actually did staffing plans for our forecast offices a week in advance. So we use our own forecast to how to staff an operational office. All right, uh, tornado outbreaks. This was a, a, the, a very famous outbreak in 1974, April 3rd through 4th. It was one of the deadliest tornado outbreaks in the 20th century, 330 fatalities, involved over one quarter of the country, 148 tornadoes in 13 states. This potential for severe weather was recognized the afternoon before, only the afternoon before. There was only one notice that was put out the evening before. Um, and the magnitude of the event itself was not realized even by those in the meteorological community, much less the emergency management community, until the evening of the event, and it had been going on for six hours. So clearly no pre-planning there. Okay, so let's go to April 14th of this year, and, and I could have picked any one of the major events from 2011, but you look at day seven, we're highlighting potential, day six, day five, day four, uh, day three, we put out a moderate risk. Day two, a high risk. Uh, this is the f a second time that we put out a high risk, two days in advance. Uh, one day, a high risk over the whole area, and then here's your outbreak. So the uh, outlooks were first issued seven days in advance, moderate risk three days in advance. Uh, preliminary, um, we had watches out, um, clearly with two to three hour lead time and then the weather service's warning lead time for tornadoes was 20 minutes. We were coordinating uh, with FEMA, and FEMA then coordinates the local emergency management community, so we, we're hitting everybody at the same time. We started coordinating with FEMA at day five. And if you look at all the testimonials on this from governors and everybody else, they were all ready uh, for this case. Um, Okay, so now East Coast snowstorms. This is one of the storms that I um, worked on while I was at Goddard, and I had to try to convince management that I really was interested in satellites. So um, this is the one I used the TOMS data for to show that you could get a tropopause fold prior to uh, cyclogenesis. Um, this is the storm system off the East Coast. Uh, nice eye-like feature. It was a very intense cyclone. Uh, 22 inches of snow, very DC. Rapid cyclogenesis off the East Coast. This wasn't predicted, the rapid cyclogenesis part wasn't predicted even hours in advance. In fact, they took the watches down at nine o'clock at night and between two o'clock in the morning and nine o'clock the next morning, we had 18 and a half inches of snow. So, th and this is the storm that I think, the, I know the operational and research community said enough. Okay, we gotta do something together. We gotta take, uh, you know, take this on. So you look at the Snowmageddon storm of February 2010 and I tell folks around the country, if, you, if you're going to hit a snow event, a major snow event, you really want to do it over Washington, D.C., okay? <laughs> um, this term came from the White House, all right, so, and they were using it before the actual storm occurred, so that's a little nerve-wracking when they're, because then if it doesn't happen, it's worse than having your kids walk into your bedroom. <laughs> um, so this is a massive winter storm. I think anybody who lived around here at that time knows it. It was two separate storm systems, historical snow amounts, actually. Uh, this, the onset of this on February 4th and 5th was predicted seven days in advance, potential for unprecedented heavy snow, three to five days in advance. Uh, states were implementing these uh, coup plans, uh, you know, shelter in place. I, the day before the storm, Virginia announced to its, its citizens, you know, be prepared to be marooned for five days, and I'm going, we better be right. <laughs> uh, the airlines cancel flight. They pre-position planes outside of the area. So they don't, they, the worst thing you want if you're running an airline is have your plane stuck at an airport with, you know, two feet of snow on its wings. So, um, they did that, and this was really interesting. The retail industry uh, pre-stocked shelves. 
Uh, there were a number of sales going on. This happened on a Friday, Saturday night. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, there were sales on everything, not just snow shovels. Right? <laughs> everything. And, there, and the sales, because they knew that their February sales period was going to be impacted by the storm. So the, the, there was no reduction in the GNP uh, after a storm, which is very unusual for a heavy snow event. So let's just look at this in a little bit more detail. This is the radar depiction. There's the watches and the warnings that went out. And what's interesting here is, um, look where the warnings cut off, right through the middle of New York City. So it's not just where it was going to snow, it's where it was not going to snow. It's just as big a part of the forecast issue. And I can tell you, for those folks who work with ensemble models, uh, and the whole ensemble modeling approach, uh, the use of ensembles is what gave the forecasters the confidence to cut those warnings off right there. If you look at the surface uh, forecast, the uh, surface law, I'm just going to go through these real quick. Here's the uh, verifying analysis for Saturday morning. Uh, major low off the East Coast, heavy snow. Here's day seven. There's day six and five. And notice that it's major storms. It, this was a slow, we were predicting it more slowly to come up the coast. It was still bringing the storm up the coast. And then you got four, three, two, one. Okay. Now, when you do forecasts like this, and you're working with the emergency management community and state agencies, uh, you know, you're not just working with them the day before the storm, you know, you're seven, six, that kind of consistency really helps you. We wish we could do this for every storm, all right? The blizzard in New York City, the year, uh, in December of the same year, there was a lot of flopping around in all of the models, not just ours. And we really didn't get that blizzard warning out, uh, blizzard condition outlook until 36 hours before the event, which when I was here at Goddard, that would be a major event, you know, success. But emergency management needs five, four, three, two days to get, get ready for it, especially during the Christmas holiday. So, uh, but this was a tremendous success. Okay, hurricane prediction skill. Um, this is the track error. A lower is better. Okay, we'll do it in nautical miles. Um, and you see where we are. We were actually doing this well before the, 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 government, the government Performance Act uh, came, came in in 1990. So we're tracking these, our performance. A lot of variability here. Some of this is related to sample size. But basically around 400 nautical mile error. This is at 72 hours. This is where the critical decisions are made, folks. If you're waiting to 24 hours before an event to have somebody come evacuate you, not going to happen. Okay, so they make the decisions at 72 hours. Uh, here's where we started doing the uh, global modeling major upgrades. It wasn't until 1992 that Bob Sheets wrote a memo saying to his folks on the forecast desk, you can look at numerical models. Up until this time, they did not use any modeling because you couldn't even get an L out of these models, much less a developing you know, cyclone, a tropical cyclone. Uh, we had advances related to U.S. Weather Research Program here, mostly in the, how we initialize models and how we, you know, brought the core of the storm into the initial state. And then you see this very constant performance here uh, related to the better physics and resolution. These are forecasts that come from the forecasters at the National Hurricane Center looking at all these models. So how does this translate into how we do the forecast? So if we're circa 2003, imagine this being Hurricane Floyd coming in as a major storm, uh, uh, 1999 time frame, and we do a cone of uncertainty like this in the day four and five. Notice how we include the coastal zone here. So even if we're predicting a turn, we have such a large swath of uncertainty that people are going to evacuate anyway, which is exactly what happened in 1999, the largest peacetime evacuation in the history of this country. And the storm did turn, and the only place that was affected by Floyd was this area here. Um, now, uh, with all the advancements we've made in the use of observations, models, and everything else, our cone of uncertainty is cut down to that amount here. And instead of having that length of a coastline, we have that length of a coastline. So we really focus the attention on where it has to be focused. So how did this work for Irene? So Irene comes in. This is last year's storm um, here. And there's our track forecast of five days with our cone of uncertainty. And that's pretty remarkable. Another reason I'm showing this one. 
Now, with Irene, as everybody knows, uh, we have major issues with intensity, okay? And that's still an issue. Um, so there you are. And then if you look at what was the most destructive part of Irene was the QPF. Uh, this is the QPF forecast um, on the left. You know, and I can tell you that from an emergency management point of view, because I'm in on those noon phone calls where they got emergency managers from every state, FEMA coordinates these calls. They knew this rain was coming. They knew it was coming on wet ground. So the emergency management community in Pennsylvania, New York, Connecticut, Massachusetts, and Vermont knew this was coming. The media chose to focus on the coast because they had, cert they had Katrina in their head. Okay? So for those who say, hey, we really underplayed the inland flooding, that's not true. Now maybe we didn't communicate it well enough. You know, you can get into that whole discussion. But the, this is a really remarkable forecast. If you look at Isaac, um, when, the, when Isaac started out here, there was a lot of uncertainty in the models uh, in its day four and five, and they, we had tracks that were pretty close to Tampa. I think people know of the, um, the consequences of that. Uh, by the time we got into this, it was in this phase, and let me tell you, a hurricane coming or a tropical storm coming in over these islands really makes a difference especially Hispaniola. I've seen a storm get absolutely wiped out crossing that island. So the forecasters will tell you that they are a lot more uncertain when a storm is sitting here than when it's sitting here, okay? So we got the storm here. Uh, the new GFS with them using in some common filter approach on its front end uh, had a fairly constant uh, wide, a narrow swath. So by this time, we were really concentrating on uh, New Orleans. Uh, this is the European Center. I show that because everybody thinks the European Center is the gold standard. I already showed you this, this, the stats. They're one day ahead of us. But uh, since they've gone to higher resolution, the, they do have a lot more model run-to-run -run variability, and the forecasters have noticed that. And I've talked to Alan Thorpe about that, and they're working on it. <laughs> Here's the QPF, and uh, the, this is the area average. Um, QPF, uh, I believe this is the forecast here. Yeah, this is the forecast. And then this is the, uh, the amount. Now this part of the forecast was tremendous, actually. The forecast over the Mid-Atlantic region uh, had a problem. And that was this, you know, the heavy rain forecast for all three days of the Labor Day weekend, which didn't happen, which is another thing I had to explain to my family. So, um, okay. So the transformation, uh, just to remind folks of where we were, especially the younger folks who think that we've been doing this forever, um, you know, this was a chart that uh, Crespin put out in 1970, uh, BAM's article, and he talked about the limits of predictability, and for things like hurricane force winds and heavy snow, we were looking at 12 hours to one day uh, type of prediction. Um, and, you know, the amounts were very vague. You get four inches or more, you knew that was a heavy snowstorm, not, you know, giving you inches per hour or, you know, the kind of detail you get now. Uh, in the midst of all this and the frustrations, you know, secondary cyclogenesis was not forecast, um, those kind of things. We had a paper like this come out by Ramaj, you know, abandoned research that uses weather sequences generated in a computer as a basis for deduction about the real atmosphere. He was serious. And there were a lot of the people in the Weather Bureau and Weather Service that was serious also. The, the cancer in the field of meteorology was computer models, okay? So, uh, and it took over 35 years for us to st actually start using these models in our forecast process. So, um, now if you substitute the word climate for weather, you got people saying the same thing now about climate projections out to decades and beyond, okay? So your climate community is confronted with the same, um, same thing. Now, so in the 70s, uh, despite this opinion, and it did have an impact on, you know, I remember being a student reading this article and wondering, asking professors, really? You know, I'm working on a model. Really? You know, I should give it up? You know, I mean, what is this? So, uh, despite this opinion, research continued on, and I emphasize the real-time numerical, it's not just that you're running models, you've got to do it in real time. So the infrastructure and how you do your analysis and things like that, that adds to the challenge. And we spent 30 years, like I said, trying to figure out how to use satellite data because you had people like Sumi and others 
emphasizing if you're going to do global observations, you've got to base it on satellites. So that was the basis of the FIGI, one of the aspects of the FIGI, uh, FIGI experiment. So today, we have a multifaceted set of data, uh, increasingly remotely sensed. Uh, it's objective, it's based on numerical models, initialized with a cube of data. We know forecasters just used to look at surface data and try to do a subjective uh, forecast. And we have national to local offices uh, collaborating uh, through a workstation environment that allows them to see what they're doing before the data is actually released. Uh, we have ongoing opportunities, the public-private sector. Uh, I think it's working really well. And I, I, when I uh, lecture in front of students, I emphasize all the new jobs uh, since the National Weather Service modernization, uh, in forecasting anyway, has been generated by the private sector. Okay, so that's 50, the last 15 years. Uh, we use an Earth system model approach, and the assimilation of satellite data is really a main driver for, um, for our whole global observing system. So today, everything you read, see, hear about weather, climate, ocean forecast begins with numerical prediction models. And these are the three major components, uh, global observing system, computers, data assimilation, modeling, and science. Now, when we have our budget exercises, of course, everybody tries to get us to prioritize between these three bullets. And I, you know, I keep on emphasizing you got a weakness in one, and the whole enterprise suffers. So, you, you know, clearly we have to make priorities in global observing systems, and we make priorities within computers, and in the, uh, the modeling and the science aspects, but we try not to, you know, use one to offset the other. So from an observations perspective, um, operationally, we're using approximately two billion observations per day now. In our, we have uh, four model cycles, so we run our models every six hours. 99.9% .9 is remotely sensed, mostly from satellites. We're increasingly using radar data. So when you see that percentage going down as we become better at using the radar data and using more of it, you'll see this percentage going down only because the radar data is now going up. Uh, we have, uh, I think this is up to 39 now. Uh, I have to check that out. But 35 different satellites now use, including uh, the MPP uh, Advanced Microwave. So we started using that seven months after launch in our operational models. When I was in this organization, it would five year lifetime on a satellite. It would take uh, NSEP and, and NOAA about three years how to figure out how to use the data. So that's 60% of your investment's already gone. All right? So clearly we needed to accelerate. The model is an Earth system model. It's not just the atmosphere anymore. We have a coupling going on. We have the uh, ocean model, we have ice, and we have land, and a little bit more specific about that in a minute. Uh, global resolution is down to 27 kilometers. We're, we're gonna be moving on to a new computer next year. By, by 2013, we're going through the transition right now, and we're looking to uh, improve that resolution. And we have resolution in North America at four kilometers. Today we're on a power six with an equivalent of about 73 trillion calculations per second. When I was here at Goddard and they ran, they, and Mill Taylor brought in the Amdahl, it was one million calculations per second and people like Joel and I were supposed to bow down in front of the machine. <laughs> um, we're now, uh, and, and we're gonna, and with this, this computer is full, okay? So we're, we're going to the IBM Dataplex about 146 trillion calculations per second. We're still ranking in the 150th or something like that. You know, Barcelona is ahead of us. So, you know, this is, the, this is one of the things I'm, I'm elevating in terms of priorities within the Department of Commerce. All right, this is our model suite. It looks complicated, and we've had a major review of NSEP, and they say, you know, you got a complicated model suite. <laughs> Part of this is driven by the user communities and our requirements that have been put on us. Part of it is, you know, everybody loves their own model, okay? So we're gonna have to go back and get into this unified modeling concept as far as we can go with it. But everything starts with this global data assimilation. We have the two billion observations per day coming in. The global forecast system is really the workhorse. It provides initial and boundary conditions for our regional. We, have, we do have regional uh, data assimilation, but you, you, know, you, you have to provide that background state and then this regional model drives the initial and boundary conditions for things like our on-call dispersion model, uh, severe weather models, very high resolution, uh, both versions of the wharf that work on a workstation and are accessible in every forecast office in the National Weather Service, our air quality model, and this rapid refresh for aviation. 
Um, we have the North American Ensemble Forecast System, so we take uh, 84 runs a day and go out to 16 days in advance and combine it with the Canadian model. So we get about 124 runs a day out to day 16. This is where our week two forecast comes from. And then our climate forecast system, which has the atmospheric and physics of the global forecast system, and it's merged with the GFDL MOM4 and the NOAA sea ice model. Uh, we have the NOAA land surface model, um, and more details in a minute. And most recently, we've implemented a space weather model, the Zenlil model. We've implemented a, a community um, ocean model, the HICOM model, it saved us about 10 years worth of development time. And now this is serving as boundary initial conditions for the National Ocean Service. They have uh, these various models, these bay models in the northern Gulf of Mexico, and we're working on several models on the west coast. And this is all based on a community model as well. So we're literally going from the sun to the sea um, with our model suite. Uh, this is this community land uh, NOAA surface model, and I show this when I go out and do a public talk just to show them how complicated it can get and how detailed the physics are now. Uh, this is a community model, and uh, one of the uh, leaders of, of the whole effort, Krista, sitting in the audience here, uh, uh, we're very actively engaged with this land information system which is used to initialize this model. Um, and uh, this is just the beginning, but I can tell you this has had a crucial impact on our boundary layer forecasts, as you would well imagine, and uh, our temperature forecast. And for those who keep track of our errors, um, one of the uh, errors that happened in our GFS during this heat wave is that we had a cool and wet bias, and it turns out that we were taking too much moisture from this layer and bringing it up and cooling through evapotranspiration, and it was lowering our temperatures on average by about two degrees, which people really noticed during that heat wave out in the uh, Midwest. Okay, so research to operations. I'll go through some historical aspects and the motivation, I think, for today's research and operational communities to work together. I did serve five years on um, NASA's Earth System Science Advisory Committee, and uh, I was actually um, watched as the research community, this was back in the late 90s and in the early part of the last decade, you know, every year you come forward with how many papers you publish and your OMB examiner sitting there saying, that's not what we're interested in. Okay, we want to know about societal impacts. And I'm sitting there as the only NOAA rep saying, I can do societal impacts for you every day. Okay, so that kind of connection we, we had to start making. So let me just show one report. Um, I've highlighted here, meteorology today is split between two groups. We have the researcher who's primarily interested in physics. He attacks his problem by the mathematical manipulation, et cetera, et cetera. The second group, on the other hand, is characterized by practicing meteorologists whose primary concern is the interpretation. Of, okay, so you get the idea, research and operations. Uh, they don't talk to each other. Uh, this situation is unfortunate. And, and, then, and then this author is particularly interested uh, in the forecast of the meteorologist who concerns himself with the analysis. You know, in the last analysis, the only measure of usefulness of a theory is the extent of its ap applicability. Okay, sounds pretty, pretty bold. Okay, that was Morris Tepper, who is famous for this paper, at least it was for us gravity wave folks. Um, he did this um, in the early 50s, as we see. He wrote that in 1952, okay? So this is, you, so you get the sense that the research and operational split has got a genetic linkage. It's, it's more than cultural, okay? So when you read the Academy study in 2000 and they talk about the Valley of Death like they're discovering it, this goes back, okay? So, you know, think about this when you, when you think about people like Charney uh, and others who were bringing in this whole new way of thinking of weather forecasting based on to what a forecast would be a very complicated set of equations to a theoreticians that was a simplified set of equations. Think about the valley of death he was crossing. So, and the team, what was brilliant about what they did was they hooked up with Weather Bureau folks and started testing it in real time right from the beginning. Real time for them was still taking two days to do a 24-hour forecast, but it's better than waiting four years, okay? So, um, but that, this is for real, okay? Um, more recently, in 2006, uh, Cliff Mass, 
wrote this paper, The Uncoordinated Giant. I know there's some problems in that paper, and he's overstated a few things, but the title is correct. Okay, and what he's basically saying is that the research agencies and the operational agencies in the United States don't work well with each other, and therefore we're at second fiddle to you know, smaller countries where everybody works well together. Okay, so there is a motivation. There's a greater emphasis on a, assessing a value added to research with links to societal benefits. Um, I think they've gone too far with it personally. Um, I like serendipity. Um, but unfortunately, when you're dealing with folks at OMB these days, they're looking for this. Okay, societal benefits are linked to advancing operational prediction enterprise used for decision support services. So, okay, big deal, we can do forecast out to seven days in advance. What is the emergency, uh, community, emergency management community doing with it, okay? Are we communicating the right way? Are they receiving the message we think we're giving? Turns out for those Alabama tornadoes and the Joplin tornado the last year, the answer is no, okay? So we had a lot of work to do, and we're working now with social scientists in ways that we probably should have been doing over the last 20 or 30 years. Um, we're expanding prediction into other areas, energy, uh, air, water quality, ecosystem health. I went to an ecosystem meeting in NOAA in 2001, 2002 timeframe, and we were supposed to look for ways of linking components of NOAA together, and I said, hey, why don't you folks get into prediction and predict the, I heard this from Joanne Simpson, by the way, because she talked about this when I was even here in the, uh, through the late 80s. And they kicked me out of the meeting because all they did was assessments. And oh, by the way, it takes 20 years to assess the Chesapeake Bay. We'll see you in 20 years, okay? So now, you know, there were some that were listening, though. Now we're actually testing ecosystem predictions, you know, system for the Chesapeake Bay. But 15, 20 years ago, these folks didn't even want to deal with prediction as a fundamental part of what they did. And we can obviously link these to societal benefits and economic value. I'd say that the health community, too, is really leapfrogging into this area, predicting where major outbreaks of various diseases could occur based on climate trends and weather. So how does this all translate at NSEP? And bear with me a, a bit on this chart, but because this is what I live, okay? So if you look at, think of this as a level of effort or a level of resources. I put resources on this diagram and told, take, take resources off. Because uh, is this research one higher or lower than other, but clearly there's a lot of resources that go into research in this country. And when they cross over to EMC, EMC works with this uh, central operations to uh, work the code. By the way, about 70 to 75% of our code is originated from outside the four walls of NCEP. So they have to make it work in an operational environment. And NCO then has to actually make sure that it's, it's a sustainable, it's IT compatible, and it's efficient. It's got to fit in those time slots. And then of course, it has to have forecast benefits before we can transition this to uh, uh, from research to operations. Well, a funny thing happens here. First of all, there's very little resources in, uh, um, put forward for the, uh, the transition process. So the research community says, and I've seen this in NASA, okay, we just fund research. No, if you want our stuff, you fund that transition process. And NOAA says, well, wait a minute, we're just getting enough money to implement these things in a very systematic way. And, keep up with what we have, it's very hard to deal with this flood of, of stuff coming at us. Um, secondly, you got two lines on this diagram crossing EMC. I can tell you that if we pick something from NOAA, we tick off NASA, DOE, you know, NSF, all right? It's, it's still internal to them. And then if we pick something from another agency, the folks in NOAA are saying, don't you realize all the money we're investing in NOAA research? How come they're not using our stuff? So who makes that decision? Okay, was as important as anything else. Well, I'm not familiar with DMC. What does that stand for? You're not familiar with EMC? What does it stand for? Environmental Modeling Center. You should, you should have that ingrained in you, Joel. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's us. Okay. Right. This is us, okay? okay? We're EMC, we're NCO, I got all the service centers, that's us. Okay, so that's where we put the test beds, all right? It's right in that intersection point. And um, I'll, I'll go over the climate test bed and the Joint Center for Satellite Data Assimilation. All these test beds are managed differently. Some of them have interagency oversight boards. 
Some of them are inherent to Noah, and they're dealing with this intersection right here, okay, because there are components of Noah that does research, all right? So this is, it was really important. We have the entities right here. And one of the other things that's important that we communicate to people who want to play in these test beds coming from the research, they understand our concept of operations, they understand our requirements, and most importantly, they understand our criteria. If, if they're finding out about our criteria like the last month, right, and they say, oh, we, I can't use your stuff because it doesn't fit. It's, it's, it's not efficient and IT compatible on our operational system. If they deliver a black box to us, can't use it, okay? So all these have to be, so you have to manage this to provide this operations to research support so that the research to operations can flow through a lot easier. Within NOAA, they have this research funnel, and the only reason I'm showing it here is to emphasize, we recognize that there's types of research, like basic research, uh, that are managed one way up here through you know, proposals, peer review, that kind of thing. But then you get a more applied research and uh, assessment activities that we really do in the test beds that get managed a different way. Decisions are made differently, okay? You don't put this out for peer review for, and then for a three-year grant and then two years into the grant say, you know, there's some other stuff that's going on that's more important. I think we're gonna end this. Okay. can't work that way, okay? So you, you really make the commitment here for the long haul in terms of the transition assessment right up to the time of operational implementation, which is something we do, okay? We take responsibility for that operational implementation. Okay, so let me give you some reasons why I think the research community is, is uh, getting more involved. You have the, uh, this seamless suite of products. The idea is, is that as you go out in time, uh, hours, days, week in advance, uh, the uncertainty will increase. I know I can't give you a perfect forecast, but as a decision maker, if I can give you a quantitative measure of certainty or uncertainty, you can use that. So think of a school superintendent at four o'clock in the morning, standing out in the street, looking up, wondering when the snow's gonna start, do I close the schools or not? Now if I give them an 80% chance of snow starting by nine o'clock in the morning, chances are at 4.30 or five, he or she's gonna decide school's out without it snowing. But if I give them 50-50, whoa, okay. <laughs> so uh, if I give them 30, you know, 30% chance, but then 80% chance by after one o'clock, they're gonna go for that half a day of school, okay, because they get a full marker for that. All right, so that's, that's what I mean. Now, in some cases, this, this um, is, we, you know, we were remarkably successful, like for the Snowmageddon case. Others, you know, it's pretty broad down in here. You know, we have uncertainty at two or three days. So we have to at least provide a measure of that all the way up, and we're responsible for forecasts through seasons. What I have highlighted here are all those, you know, good representation of the models, the time frame that they operate under, and what I'm pointing out here are ensemble systems which we've introduced over the last 10 years that weren't there in 2000. So we're seeing the second revolution in the ensemble uh, forecast for weather prediction. So within a test bed now, the climate test bed, people are interested in using that. C the CFS is an ensemble forecast system. We do four runs a day out to uh, 10 months. So at the end of a month, you have you know, four times 120 runs that get you to out beyond nine months. So we update the seasonal forecast uh, every month. So that's a lot of runs, okay? People want to use that. We want to provide that to them. That's the O2R. Not only the CFS, but the reanalysis and the reforecast. It's a, it's a tremendous burden on us to get that out to the research community. We're taking that on because people working with this model, whether it's in research organizations or in India or wherever it's going on now, the research that's done with that will feed back into the development. So that's the R2O part. The climate test bed helps uh, manage that and the CPC, folks, as you get down into this funnel, um, the CPC then actually helps translate the products that come out of the climate forecast system into operations. And one of the bennies for the research community that works with this is that once you get through the CPC and the model development and all that, you've got this incredibly large user community 
that uses this stuff. Okay? So this is the way we're trying to make this work. Here's the model now. Um, the um, CFS version 1 was 200 kilometers, version 2 is 27 kilometers. Uh, we, the atmospheric model uh, was uh, 200, uh, like I said, down to 164 levels. All of this physics is now built in to the CFS. The ocean model is listed here, the land surface model, which we're using in the weather model as well. The sea ice model, we didn't even have sea ice in version one. We have coupling at 30 minutes. We do the, the same type of assimilation for the, uh, for the climate model now that we do for the weather model with radiances assimilated. And we provide reforecasts uh, for uh, 24 for a month and 124 per month for weeks three through six. So this is an infrastructure that's there. People want to do research with ensemble model output. It's pretty hard to replicate in a research community what's going on here. Now, you do have research centers which are doing models in real time now, and we're accumulating those models, and we're bringing them together for what we call a national multi-model ensemble, which is being run in the research community. And operationally, we're now partners with the European Center uh, the UK Met and Media France in something we call EuroSIP and we run these operationally and these have all become part uh, now of the uh, uh, product suite coming out of CPC. So this is an incredible investment. This is an incredible investment. Um, and you not, like I said, you not only uh, have access to the CFS, and there are research communities that are actually running the CFS and doing decadal and 100-year runs. But you get all of this information, the reanalysis, reforecast. You, you know, you get large number of ensemble members, the operational research community. So, why am I interested in this? What is science community? What is the operate? What is the optimal operational system? Uh, how many models do we need? Okay. To what extent do we need model diversity? You know, with physics, dynamic core, initial state coupling, all of the above. This is still all out there as research issues. Uh, and, and then how do we extract the maximum information on weather, climate, water linkage from week two to decadal? So how you post-process the model is different if you're in a very short range climate domain than if you're in the longer range. Okay, what is that? How do we calibrate those models? This is something that Kohler, for example, is working on very extensively. Okay, the other example is this joint center uh, for satellite data assimilation. I actually, even in NOAA, I call this the NASA NOAA DOD. And they say, why do you put NASA first? And I just say it's alphabetical. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's, it's, all, it's all part of it. Okay, so here you see the three NOAA components, OAR, Weather Service, NESIS, uh, NASA Earth System, your, his Franco's replacement. It used to be Franco and I would be talking together, and now we, you know, we're making this work. Uh, we, yeah, <laughs> trying to. Uh, we have the Air Force and uh, the Navy, and we have this vision statement. Uh, we clearly want to be the world leader in applying satellite data uh, and res uh, the operational satellite data and research the operational goals, uh, especially as it relates to prediction. And the mission is to accelerate, and that's a key part of it. Um, you know, we can't spend two to three years uh, trying to figure out how to use satellite data. Even though the satellites are lasting longer these days, that's still uh, uh, an investment you don't want to waste. Uh, some of the accomplishments, uh, we now have a community radiative transfer model, the CRTM. All partners are using that. Uh, this is the fast forward radiative transfer scheme you use in the uh, prediction system to make your model data look like the satellite data. So now you're, you're actually assimilating the deltas um, into the models. Uh, we, uh, we use a common NOAA NASA land data assimilation system. Again, uh, Christopher Ladard's involved in that. Uh, we have numerous new satellite data uh, systems using operationally MODIS. Uh, this is um, something where NASA headquarters said, if you don't get MODIS in there, we're not interested. We had like one or two years to get MODIS in. Uh, we had AIRS, uh, was the top priority new instrument we were looking at. We're now pulling in IOSI hyperspectral IR radiances. We're using all the GPS RO sensors. Uh, we're, look, uh, we're working with SSMIS. This is not an easy satellite to work with. Its biases change with the ascending and descending orbits, making it really difficult 
to work with. Uh, WinSat and JSON2. Um, we got other things here. We have uh, the adjoint sensitivity diagnostics that Ron Gilero has pioneered. Uh, we're working with that. Um, one of the things that uh, was really helpful to us, uh, the new supercomputer at Goddard was jointly funded by NASA and NOAA and was installed and operated uh, by NASA for the Joint Center. It's uh, over on the other side in the old sector of this campus. Uh, and then the handoff to, uh, to NSEP of the MPP ATMS data assimilation capability uh, between EMC, NESDAS, NASA, and, and the Joint Center. Uh, we implemented uh, the, the uh, MPP microwave data seven months after launch, and we're working with the CRIS data. We have to go through a moratorium for the computer transfer, but uh, it's looking good. Now we use all of these satellites, and you see the research data that's used along with the operational. Um, uh, we're doing studies like take out all of the um, uh, satellite data, which is, uh, here's your northern hemisphere with all the data, you take out all the satellite data, uh, you get a statistically significant de degradation, you take out the, uh, the in-situ data, uh, you also get a statistically significant. Uh, in the southern hemisphere, look at the decrease you get by taking out the satellite data, you, get a, you, know, you just don't have that much in-situ data in the southern hemisphere, so you don't get much of an impact. And of course, this impacts our days, four, five, six, seven forecasts if we uh, have this kind of uh, degradation. Uh, with the adjoint, we can actually look at instruments which are giving the most value. And notice that the radius sign is right up there at the top, and GPSRO is pretty good as well. Uh, one of the reasons for this uh, is no bias. And I have to tell you that in observing systems, if you have a bias, it kills you, okay? So um, it, it really, um, it's still a backbone for uh, what we do. Um, and again, this is all Ron Gilero's work. Uh, you can actually look at uh, individual channels uh, within various instruments and you can work to see what's improving. So you can emphasize the, you know, the use of those channels and what's degrading. Uh, and we weren't aware of that. You know, we were just pulling everything in, so we became a lot more selective in how we use the uh, AIRS data um, as we went through um, our use of uh, the research uh, instruments. Okay, so in this slide, I'm just highlighting various things now that where I believe it's been successful uh, working between NASA and NOAA. Uh, we have uh, participation in our new data assimilation system, which is a hybrid in some common filter plus 3D VAR. Uh, Ron Gilero working with uh, Jeff Whitaker at Ezreal and, and uh, John Derber at, at NSEP, and we had uh, participation from Oklahoma as well. Uh, we pulled this off and did it, uh, got it into operations a year ahead of our original schedule. Uh, through the Joint Center, we have um, uh, these. Uh, uh, AOs that go out uh, based on our high priority areas like emissivity, uh, surface emissivity especially. Uh, we have these adjoint based forecasts, we have the hydro land surface. And I haven't mentioned this uh, so far in the talk, but yesterday we implemented GoCart as a part of our global forecast system, which gives us for the first time aerosol and dust forecast operationally, and that went in yesterday. And this is a result of uh, about four or five years worth of effort. I don't know if Michelle's in the room or not, but her group and our group worked very hard on this to, to get this in. Okay, so in summary, uh, the forecast prediction has arrived as a fundamental part of our science. We don't have to make excuses for prediction being a part of our science anymore. It's, it's not an art, it's a science. Uh, we're advancing the general forecast skill uh, and we really have made tremendous uh, um, advances in pre predicting extreme events. The R2O is becoming an integrated part of uh, the research and operational communities and I've mentioned this. Here are my, my ground rules uh, for why it works, when it works. Um, I've seen uh, situations and I was part of that when I was here, I was writing all these papers for uh, uh, joint forecast facilities. I had no idea what I was talking about. Um, you got to come to the table as equal partners. So, you know, it's not that you're a better modeler than our modelers. You might have some theoretical aspects that you're more familiar with now or are using, but I can tell you that our modelers are the best model engineers in the world. They've got to make this work every day in a time window that's probably half of what you think you have to work with going into it. So, you got to be equal partners going in. You got to respect each other's mission. 
Don't confuse real time with operational. You know, 95% uh, availability is not good enough for operations. We're at 99.93 for our operational models. All right. Uh, increasing use of community model approach to common model infrastructure is a key thing. If you're not part of these community models, it's a lot harder for you to get in. Um, you still have a long way to go to become a coordinated giant. Uh, we, I think we're just scratching the surface, and part of it is, is that we're still under-resourced the R2O process. This taking predictions to the next level, you know, based on all of our successes, is the central theme for the upcoming AMS a meeting. I'm president and I'm responsible for this meeting. I got people like Krista, Peter Ladard on, on our uh, organizing committee. I can tell you that the wet side was way ahead of the dry side in terms of planning. We're finally catching up. Uh, but the idea now is you know, folks doing ecosystem prediction, health prediction, uh, energy, alter alternative energy, and the predictions needed for them. It's all going to be part of this conference, uh, and that's January 4th through 10th. And we're open for business at the new NOAA Center for Weather and Climate Prediction. I don't have a bunch of pictures because you're just down the road from us. Come and visit us. But that's what it looks like when you drive up. It looks a lot different than the World Weather Building. <laughs> And I have to tell you that uh, folks who, uh, you know, you, you, everybody knows in the workforce you have people who are always pessimistic. Well, I had a, several of those very pessimistic folks come up to me and, and basically thank us for doing this, okay? And people walk around about this high off the ground now. I mean, it's really, really amazing. So we have NESDIS Star, we have uh, NESDIS, uh, the Satellite Analysis Branch, we have uh, Air Resources Laboratory that's doing all that dispersion modeling. They're all in there. Uh, we have a conference center, 464 seat auditorium, uh, lots of things in this building. A, a major uh, uh, data center here that's allowing us to do all the post processing. We do not have our supercomputers on in this building. We have them remotely dispersed um, and we make them operate uh, remotely. So that's right across, if you're familiar with Tony Busalaki's palace, he's across the street. He won the race. We had a race of who was going to get in the building first. I learned a lot about Chapter 7 bankruptcy, <laughs> two, and a, a two and a half year delay associated with that. But I think even he's a little bit jealous of this building. So with that, I thank you for your attention. And I think the battery you ran died. out. I wore the battery out. Yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, we've got a couple minutes. Anybody have any quick questions for Louis? Oh. Uh, can you comment on the air quality forecast if no one is responsible for that and where it stands? Oh, okay. So he asked about the air quality forecast, which is near and dear to my heart. We run the models for the air quality forecasts that are released by the state. You know, there's some confusion that we release the air quality forecast. We enable it. Uh, as part of the budget crisis that we've gone through over the last year or so, uh, that was offered up for cuts and the department took it. Uh, so within the president's budget, that has been zeroed out. But I can tell you that there are, you know, there are those on the Hill that are interested in us keeping that going. And in fact, uh, I'm not even allowed to turn that model off even though I don't have any support for it. So it's, it's in limbo um, and I think it'll get sorted out through the, once we get our 2013 budget and whatever congressional language comes with that budget will determine exactly where that, uh, our air quality capabilities uh, lie. But that's just for the, um, the regional model. This is one of the reasons why we're so interested in getting the go-kart in uh, because now that gives us global capabilities which we can now build upon and work off of our global model. And, and of course, we need all that information for a lot of things besides the air quality forecast. So we're still hopeful. It's the only thing you can be these days, you know, it's hopeful. Any other questions? Thank you all again. All right, thanks.